Okay, well, hello everybody and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Designing with Native Plants with Rhonda Burnett. Uh, the Grow Native program is a native plant marketing and education program that serves the lower Midwest. It's run by the Missouri Prairie Foundation, which is a 55 year old land trust that protects original prairies as well as carries out prairie reconstructions, prairie outreach and education and supports research. You can learn more about the Prairie Foundation and its Grow Native program at moprairie.org and grownative.org. Uh, my name is Brooke Widmar. I'm the Director of Administrative Operations and Member Engagement for the Foundation. I want to thank you all for joining us for this week's webinar. We have an exciting lineup of webinars and master classes scheduled through March on a variety of topics, and we're already working on April's lineup. So I hope you can join us for more this winter and spring. Um, I do want to take a moment to recognize and thank the Grow Native sponsors listed here on the screen. Their support makes educational opportunities like this one possible. And I also want to thank the many of you who donated to the Grow Native program as you registered for this. Uh, so for today's webinar, we've invited Rhonda to talk about a highly requested topic, design, and her presentation will be about 45 minutes long, and then we'll have time for a question and answer session at the end. During the presentation and uh, and the Q&A session. If you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A section or the comments down below um, on your screen. And when Rhonda is done presenting, uh, Carol will come on and ask her your questions. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned in today's discussion. So to introduce today's speaker, Rhonda Burnett has been a community conservation planner with the Missouri Department of Conservation since 2005 and currently serves as the chair of the Grow Native Committee. Rhonda holds a Bachelor of Landscape and Ar Landscape Architecture from Louisiana State University and a Master's of Urban Environmental and Land Use Planning from the University of Kansas. So without further ado, take it away, Rhonda. Thank you so much, Brooke. So my name is Rhonda and I work for the state government agency that conserves the fish, forest, and wildlife resources. The subject of my talk today is designing with native plants, tips for species selection, design concepts, and maintenance practices. The photo you see here on the screen was taken at a natural area in the Ozarks. I would highly recommend if you are just now learning about native plants to get out in the field, go for a hike, and enjoy these plants in their natural habitats. Other wonderful ways to learn about them include visiting the websites of Grow Native and the Missouri Botanical Garden, as well as looking through the catalogs of native plant suppliers. They include information about growing conditions needed by these plants and often will contain many beautiful photographs of them. The focus of my talk today is going to be on plant selection tips. The criteria you see on this slide are the ones that um, will help you to select plant species. They are listed in no particular order except for the very last one, finalizing your plant species list. You should not go into a project already thinking that you know what plants you will use in your design. Instead, you should consider all of the criteria that go into selecting plant species. And once you do that, you'll end up with a list of plants that will help you meet your project goals and objectives. And then you can contact the suppliers, the plant nurseries, and based on their availability, you will finalize your plant list for your project. The photograph on this slide in a lot of ways is similar to the one that we just saw, but this is not a natural area. This photo was taken at the Lori Garden in Millennium Park in downtown Chicago, Illinois. Every plant you see here was selected by a designer. The first of that list of criteria that we will consider is how site programming can help you with your plant selection. As you begin your project, you need to think about who will be using your project, who will be in that space, and how they will use it. Are you designing for a very private backyard, for a quasi-public front yard, or for a very public space, such as a park or the grounds of a library? Besides people, who else might be using your site? Will wildlife be drawn there? And if so, are the plants that you selected going to provide them with food or shelter or more extensively for their uh, nesting and breeding needs? In addition to um, the users of the space, you might want to consider if you will be incorporating gathering spaces into your design or spaces for certain activities to take place. 
or perhaps you'll need room for stillness and quiet. Will your project also need to incorporate some work zones? Working landscapes may include a produce garden in your backyard or a rainwater management practice. But now that we're talking about working landscapes, let's go ahead and consider green infrastructure. Green infrastructure consists of strategically planned and managed networks of natural lands, engineered systems, working landscapes, and other open spaces that can serve ecosystem values and functions and provide associated benefits to human populations. Ecosystem services are water provided through green infrastructure practices. These are the benefits of nature to people, households, communities, and economies. Ecosystem services can be subdivided into four categories, including provisioning services, such as food, fiber, and fresh water. Regulating services are those such as soil formation, or excuse me, regulating services are those such as flood control, disease control, and climate regulation. Supporting services are those such as soil formation and retention, crop pollination, and the nutrient cycling that maintains conditions for life on earth. And then finally, cultural services are those non-material benefits people obtain from ecosystems through spiritual enrichment, cognitive development, reflection, recreation, and aesthetic experiences, including but not limited to knowledge systems and social relations. One of the infrastructure projects that I work on most frequently involves rainwater management. This slide features some of my very favorite native plants to include in these practices. They include buttonbush, copper iris, soft rush, and mist flower. The photo on the lower right side of the slide shows a rain garden that was constructed in a residential neighborhood in Springfield, Missouri. It's one of a series. You can see another rain garden just up the block from the one featured. And this series of rain gardens was installed to divert water off of the street after it rained to try to alleviate some flooding that was happening at the intersection down the block where water was pooling. Another rainwater management project is featured in this before and after project. This is located at Government Plaza in the city of Springfield. You can see in the upper left part of each photo, the roof of a little small storage shed. So as the parking lot of this uh, government plaza was renovated, they took out the very narrow little mode strip of turf grass that was essentially an ecological desert and replaced it with a large bioswell full of native plants that filter pollutants from runoff that comes from the parking lot as well as provide other benefits. Another ecosystem service involves the retention of soil or the prevention of soil erosion. Plants associated with prairie landscapes are highly regarded for this service because of their well-developed extensive root systems that are great for holding soil in place. Now let's go on to consider how a theme might influence your plant selection. In this section, we'll consider a few design concepts We'll look at the strategy of naturescaping versus nativescaping and consider some of the art elements that are probably some of the most useful when it comes to garden and landscape design. The photo on this slide shows a healing and meditation garden at a hospital. Every element in this garden was selected to try to achieve those results. The cool colors of the plants, the water feature, all work together to meet that project objective for this design. Another themed garden is located in Joplin, Missouri. A memorial park was established to commemorate the devastation of a tornado that hit the community in 2011. Now you can have a themed space within a larger themed garden. In this case, there is a small butterfly garden that is located within the memorial park. The photo in the center bottom of the slide shows the, the plants that were selected for this butterfly garden. While they're not all native to the Joplin area, they were selected to try to attract butterflies here. Now, of course, pure natives to the area would provide the best habitat for butterflies, but the intent of this space was to create a small sense of beauty and, and a celebration of life and beauty that help really balance how solemn the 
the park is overall in its purpose to provide a memorial. If we leave Joplin and travel south, we can visit the Garvin Woodland Gardens in Arkansas. Place yourself in the photograph on the left side of the screen. Imagine that you're walking along that woodland path and you come to the chapel in the woods that was designed by architect Faye Jones. In front of that chapel, you see the large bed of woodland ferns featured in the photo on the right. They go along with the theme of the woodland park wonderfully, but just imagine if instead of those ferns, that bed were full of brightly colored knockout roses. How different would this, this place feel and look if that were the case? Consideration of a woodland garden is the perfect segue to the next topic, which is naturescaping. Naturescaping is when a natural terrestrial community, such as a woodland, or in the case of this photograph, a prairie, are replicated in your design. When you are not trying to replicate a natural community type, but you are still using native plants in your, in your project plan, you are no longer, you are not naturescaping, you are nativescaping, as in the case of the photos on this slide. These come to us from two different businesses in Missouri. The photo on the left is a, an entryway garden outside, the, outside of a corporate headquarters in St. Louis, Missouri. They've combined golden ragwort as a ground cover with wild hydrangea and a redbud tree. On the right, there's an elevated bed surrounding an outdoor restaurant patio. It is full of a monoculture of switchgrass and we can tell it is a cultivar and not the pure native because of the foliage color. It's much more red than the green of the pure native, which when naturescaping, oftentimes pure natives are specified because of all the ecological benefits they provide. In certain cases though, a designer might opt to use a cultivar if they are endeavoring to feature a certain artistic element that is exhibited by the cultivar and not the pure native. In this case, the switchgrass has a much more reddish tinge to its foliage and the designer may have been wanting to create a complementary color palette with the colors featured in this restaurant chain, such as the green of that patio umbrella. Since we're talking about color, let's move into the art elements. This slide does a fantastic job of bringing home the point that you can look at native plants just based on their individual artistic elements. So you can pull out each of those elements and look at them individually in a plant instead of just thinking about the plant um, as a one part of an overall design. You can think about each plant individually in your design. So in color, we've got a painting here that features oranges and yellows and golds. Those same colors can be seen in the, um, in the stem color of certain dogwood shrubs. Looking below the color images, we see value represented in the painting and the black and white photograph of birch trees. Value refers to lightness or darkness. On the right side of the screen, we see a discussion of how points and lines can be joined together to create shapes, which are two dimensional. When a shape is brought into the third dimension, it, it becomes a form. So the painting on the top, we see the two dimensional image that is really brought to life with the photograph of the plants. And you can see from their third dimension, they're no longer shapes, they are now forms. Let's not leave color so quickly because there is a lot of color theory. Some of that has to do with which color combinations are the most pleasing to look at. So as we consider the color wheel, it is thought that colors adjacent to each other on the color wheel, these are called analogous colors, are very pleasing to look at. So the photograph of the royal catch fly and the rose verbena exhibit this, this concept of analogous colors. Complementary colors are those opposite each other on the color wheel, and those are also very pleasing to look at. This color combination of yellow and purple or violet is represented in the photograph on the right, where the yellow blooms of gray-headed coneflower 
are blooming at the same time as, as the purple blooms of the wild bergamot. Proportion is the next art element that we'll consider. And we're going back to Lurie Garden in Chicago for, to illustrate this art element. Proportion is the relationship of sizes between different parts of a work. Now, as we consider the concept sketch on the left side of the screen, you can see the curving purple line as it bisects a larger field of green. That concept was brought to life. The garden was planted. You can see a photograph of that on the right side of the screen. And I think that the designer did an excellent job of selecting the proportion of the purple to the green. If that purple line had been any more narrow or had been wider, I don't think the purple color would pop as much as, it, as you can see that it does in that photograph. This slide is all about visual weight and how balanced or heavy it is. A feeling of balance results when the elements of design are arranged either symmetrically or as in the photo on the left, asymmetrically to create the impression of equality in weight or importance. I think that this grouping of plants does an excellent job of creating asymmetrical balance. You've got one large tree, perfectly visually balanced in that bed with all the individual clumps of wildflowers. In terms of landscape design, the strongest focal point with the greatest visual weight is the dominant element of the work. Elements with the least visual weight are subordinate. The photo on the right, I don't know about you, but personally, it makes me a little uncomfortable to look at it. And I think it's because this concept of dominance and subordination is not being realized. Shining Blue Star is used here as a ground cover and I absolutely love that native plant. But in this particular bed, because it is paired with a redbud tree, which is a small ornamental tree, I think it, it causes a, a relationship of, of visual weight where one of those features is not the dominant. So it, it just seems a little off. If a shorter ground cover species had been selected or even a taller tree had been selected and really established that relationship of dominance and subordination, I think that would be a much more visually pleasing design. Harmony and unity are elements that are very similar to each other. And in fact, I could have omitted one of these and just used, uh, just used one term, but I had two pictures here that show this, this um, concept beautifully. So I decided to throw in both terms. Harmony and unity both refer to all the individual elements of a design working together to form a cohesive whole. The photo on the left is from the High Line in New York City. And I think that the heuchera plant in the center of the bed there pulls together beautifully the colors of the benches with the greens of the other plants in that bed. All together, all those individual elements create a very pleasing united design or excuse me, harmonious design. In the, harmoni in the unified design on the right, we have a private residence from central Missouri and every individual element here from the hardscaping materials to the colors, to the materials of the house and the individual native plant species selected for the front yard landscaping all work together to create a very unified design. Rhythm involves the use of recurring elements to direct the eye through the image. As we see here in the photo on the left, the line of bald cypress trees has a very dominant vertical trunk and that pulls your eye and leads your eye. Your eye cannot help but to travel along the street and follow that line of trees down the block. Time is an interesting element because it is considered in the landscape by changes in the appearance of a plant over the course of a growing season or over the course of the plant's entire lifetime as it matures, especially in the case of trees as they mature from seedling to adult. The photo I have here to represent the element of time is the same clump of little blue stem, one photo taken in the summer and the other in the fall. You can see here that 
the element that has remained the same is not only the size of the plant, but its form. Elements that have changed over time include the color and the texture of the plant. Texture does lead us to the next art element. We can consider not only tactile texture or how a plant feels when you touch it, but also its visual texture. This is one of the more fun elements, in my opinion, to play with um, when you're doing your garden design plans to see how the texture, the visual texture of one plant looks combined with other plants. The golden sill photographed on the left has a coarse visual texture, although it does seem if you were to reach out and touch it, it would have a very smooth tactile texture. And then the grasses massed together in the photo on the right appear to have a very feathery fine texture, both visually and tactilely. The final art element I'll share today is variety. Variety involves the use of different art elements to create visual interest. Here we have two different species of grasses along the left side of this walkway. They have a very similar color as well as similar visual textures, but the sizes and the forms of those grasses lend variety to the size of the bed. An increased sense of variety occurs if you go to the end of the sidewalk and look back the other direction. Now those grasses are on the right side of the bed, but combined with all the other plants here in this uh, garden in Bentonville, Arkansas, they've re it's resulted in a lot of variety. Now that we've walked through all these plant selection tips, I'd like to um, bring it all together, bring it to life for you, and go over a case study of a project that I've worked on uh, here with the Missouri Department of Conservation. I brought in all of that, that list of six uh, plant selection criteria onto this slide uh, so we can all remember those. This particular project was a brand new construction, a new Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum to celebrate the famous author of the Little House on the Prairie books. So when I was first approached to be involved in this project, I was provided with this rendering, this artist rendering of what the museum building would look like. And the, the, the desire to replicate some a prairie landscape in the front landscaping beds of the museum to welcome visitors and really bring home that, that theme of the Little House on the Prairie books. Now you can see from this artist's rendering that there's maybe the idea that prairie plants only get to be about three inches tall. So um, that had to be addressed as far as expectations. But in my first meeting on this project, I was able to learn quite a few things that I would need for my plant selection. I learned that the theme or the concept of this project um, was very much that they wanted to nature scape and reproduce a prairie. I knew that the space would be programmed as a museum that is visited by, they tell me approximately 30,000 people a year. So a heavily used space, um, but people are going to stay out of the beds, hopefully stay on the sidewalks. So the space would be highly viewed. Um, so I knew how it would, be, it would be programmed. I knew what the theme was. The next step was to identify any green infrastructure needs. When I was approached to work on this project, that was right at the time when the plight of the, the declining population of the, of the butterfly, the monarch butterflies, um, was just really being shared around the world. So there was a lot of interest that this particular project also provide some habitat for monarch butterflies. That was all the information I had until I conducted a site visit. And when I did, this is what I found. So I was able to analyze site conditions. Um, I did discover that that front landscaping bed was much steeper than it appeared on that rendering. So another ecosystem service um, was identified, that of soil erosion control which I wasn't worried about because I knew we were already planning to use prairie species that have those extensive root systems. So my only concern was keeping that soil in place until the plants could become established 
and perform that ecosystem service for us. So I had a started developing a list of plants that I would potentially use on this project based on the criteria that I'd already determined. I mapped out all the plants I was considering based upon the time of year that they typically will bloom. You can see there is a bar along the bottom of your screen that shows per month how many of the plants on my list could be expected to be blooming. I wanted to try to have the most plants blooming during the summer months when it was likely the museum would receive the most visitors of any other time throughout the year just because of summer breaks from school and family vacations. So the plants listed here bloom most in June, July, and August. That next to last step was to contact nurseries and check on availability of these plants for purchase. So on this chart here, if you look on the graph on the left, the far left column shows the amount of each species I wanted to order. And then next to it, it shows how many of those species was available at this particular nursery. Now, I had this same, this same uh, list of plants that I checked uh, several different nurseries on to find the, the availability. At this particular nursery, if you scroll down the list, you get to the red font there of butterfly weed. At this nursery, they didn't have the smallest containers possible, which because of the size of this project and we were ordering so many plants, I wanted to order the smallest container sizes possible um, in an effort to keep project costs as low as possible. At this particular nursery though, the quart size container was the smallest they had for butterfly weed. So I knew if we ordered from here, our cost for butterfly weed would be a little bit higher. Now on the right side of the screen is where I was checking on availability of the grass species I was going to use. Three species were going to be incorporated into the landscape beds and mixed in with the flowers. But I wanted one species to be used as a border grass and create a little bit of a, an ornamental uh, formal border um, before the interior of the beds were naturescaped as prairies. I had certain art elements in mind. I knew I wanted um, basically a smaller grass. So I, I had a size in mind and I had a form in mind. I wanted a nice uh, fountain form. I thought that would look a, a little bit more formal than something upright. So I had identified two potential species, side oats, grandma and prairie drop seed. At this particular nursery, they had 400 small containers of side oats, grandma. According to my calculations, I was going to need 401 um, border grasses. Now in a project such as this, one plant plus or minus would not have made any difference, but I went ahead and used that as my reason for specifying prey drop seed on my final plant list, as opposed to side oats grandma, just based on availability. So um, I will show you now pictures of the plants that we ended up including in these beds. These images are in order of when they bloom. So starting in the early spring, and going all the way through fall. So the first bloomers in this project are going to be the heart-leaved Alexanders. Then we included purple milkweed and butterfly weed, prairie coreopsis, white prairie clover, purple coneflower, culver's root, Missouri coneflower, gray goldenrod, rough blazing star, and smooth aster. For the grasses, we of course, decided on that prairie drop seed as our border grass. And then the interior bed grasses that we selected were split beard blue stem, broom sedge, and little blue stem. I'd like to share with you now how I determined how many plants that we needed to order. So now that we had our plants selected by species and we knew they were available from at least one nursery to purchase, we needed to know um, how well this calculation happened before we checked availability, but um, to walk through now step by step how we did the calculations. First, we had to measure out the area of the plant bed. And for this one side of the project, 
it came to be almost 2000 square feet. I decided I wanted to space all of the plants in the bed at 18 inches apart from each other. This was done for a couple of reasons. One spacing was going to be a whole lot easier to plant than having different spacing requirements for different species. So to simplify planting day, we went with one spacing for every single plant. This was also um, spaced far enough apart that we could easily get in while these plants were becoming established to do the weeding until the plants became established enough to the point where they could outcompete the weeds. And also it was a tight enough spacing that it wouldn't take too long before the plants would really fill in the beds. So based on that square footage and that spacing, we knew we needed a total of 800 plants for this one bed. How did we know that? I imagine that's a question that you're asking. And I, I know for a fact, I learned this calculation in college and somehow somewhere a long time, I lost it. I don't know the calculation, but I do know that you can cheat and go to a landscape calculator online. There are many, many of them. The one that I have bookmarked is at landscapecalculator.com. And on the left side of your screen, you can see they have free calculators to calculate how much mulch you need for a bed and also the how many plants you need. Their annual calculator can also be used for other types of plants to give you the, the correct spacing. The square at the top of the screen shows you that when I plugged in my square footage and my plant spacing, the calculator told me I needed 800 plants. If I was going to be planting in a triangular pattern and leave enough space along the edge of the bed that would equal the spacing between plants. You can do calculations other ways and the other four squares on the screen show you how the calculation was done in four different ways but I will point out that each of those other ways ended up telling you you needed more than 800 plants for this bed. So if your budget is of a concern or like in this project, you end up ordering thousands of plants, the fewer that you have to order, the better. There's no worse feeling, especially when you're spending someone else's uh, money for a project than accidentally ordering too many plants and then not having anywhere else to use the extras. So over time, I've just learned it's best to do an accurate calculation where you end up ordering just the number of plants you need. Now, a rule of thumb when planting both wildflowers and grasses is that unless you will have the capability to do intensive maintenance throughout time, it's best to overplant the grasses as compared to, or excuse me, the flowers as compared to the grasses because over time, grasses do tend to want to take over a bed. So I generally do 70% flowers to 30% grasses, although you can go 80, 85% flowers and you know, 15 to 20% grasses, that would be just fine. So the darker box there on the right hand side of the screen shows that for 70% of 800 plants total meant I needed to order 560 uh, flowers and then that meant I needed 240 grasses. But remember, one of those grasses was a border species. So I had to calculate the linear feet of the bed, divide that by 18 inch spacing. And that told me I needed 102 of my 240 grasses needed to be my border species. And then the rest could be an equal amount of the other three. Okay, so what does this project look like once, um, once it's planted? We planted in April of 2016, and you can see along the top of that slope that we did install some supplemental erosion control materials to help hold that slope in place until those plants became established. And I am happy to report that, that we had no issues with erosion at this, at this project. And I was worried about that because of how steep these slopes are. So the next slide I'm going to show you is from a year and a half later in October of 2017. And this is what the project looks like. The fall artistic attributes of these plants are stunning. The grasses have beautiful russet and copper colors. There we see some goldenrod blooming in the foreground. 
I think though that the grasses are the showstopper here. The little blue stem, the side uh, split beard blue stem and the broom sedge are just stunning. This may be one of my, one of the few gardens that I think looks the best in the fall season than any other time of the year. So the next photo I will show you will be from um, half a year later, the following summer. So this is October, 2017. We'll go now to June of 2018. So you can see now that the bed is starting to fill in more with the plants. Um, it's hard to tell, but right along the edge of the sidewalk, you can see the border grass that was used, that prairie drop seed. And then of all the heartwarming successes when you're trying to provide habitat for a certain species, to get out there in the field and see the milkweed blooming was amazing. The milkweed, the purple milkweed and the butterfly weed were selected because they do like to grow in the drier soil conditions of this sloped bed. There is a small pond across the parking lot from this, these landscape beds where we did also plant some swamp milkweed that likes some wetter soils. But to just try to supplement the habitat needed for the, the monarchs as much as possible in this general location, the milkweed, of course, being a host plant for the monarchs to lay their eggs on. That does bring us to the end of our plant selection tips. I will go over a few maintenance tips now. If you look closely at this photograph, it may, it just may appear that that shrub is giving the trug a big old hug, but I promise you it's not. When you do your initial site plan, you need to think about where your plants are going to be planted. And as you do your layout plan, make sure you give enough room between the edge of your bed and from a building foundation that once the plants reach their mature size, you can walk all the way around them to provide all of their maintenance needs, whether it's pruning or um, maybe refreshing mulch in the bed. But you want to avoid instances like this where you have conflicts between the plants and the people who use the space. Going back now to Government Plaza in Springfield, we can see how the grounds crew here did the uh, winterized one of their parking lot beds. The photo on the left is from the fall and features prairie drop seed in the foreground with its uh, big beautiful seed heads. And next to it on the right is Virginia sweet spire. It's a low growing native shrub that has beautiful uh, reddish maroon fall color. As does the black gum tree planted in the center of that bed it just hasn't quite uh, put on its fall colors yet. The photo on the right shows that the grounds crew did go in and cut the, the grasses down to the ground. And this is a good time of year now that you can really get in there and walk through that bed. And um, because it is a water, a rainwater infiltration bed, as you can see, because of the curb, the, the curb cuts on the right side of the bed. Um, now would be the time of year to see if there were any erosion gullies that needed to be filled and, and repaired to remove litter and trash and check on the woody species to see if they need um, to be pruned or you know if, if they're doing okay and then to see if the mulch needs to be refreshed. So in that example the grasses were cut down to the ground during the winter time. In this photograph they obviously were not cut back. Some people leave the dormant vegetation up year round either for the appearance of it or because the plants are providing habitat to certain wildlife, uh, to certain insects that like to uh, nest in the stems of dormant species over winter. But if you do leave all that foliage standing, you need to get out to the beds and cut it back before the new growth starts in the spring, just to give the new growth the, the room it needs to grow. and. It also, it's just an annual maintenance need to get in there and, and take care of the plants in your bed. Once you remove that dormant or the, the dead growth, you can either burn it or you can compost it in your yard or some communities have a community uh, yard waste center where they will compost um, the waste materials and then make that compost available for gardeners to um, purchase and reincorporate the nutrients into their gardens. 
This is a before and after photograph of a rain garden project that I worked on here in Springfield at the Community Foundation of the Ozarks headquarters. On the left, you can see where water was ponding. You also see a lot of cigarette butts that have washed um, down to this low point from upstream. Once the rain garden was installed, unfortunately, that won't prevent people from littering. So uh, cleaning up litter is going to be an ongoing maintenance need here. Before I get to the ma next maintenance need, um, associated with this particular project, I do want to admire how beautiful that palm sedge looks that's um, used as the border, the front border species in this project. No, it wasn't litter, it was weeds that became the maintenance issue here. Now a weed is simply any plant that is growing where you don't want it to be growing. So this is an example where a native species that was planted on purpose became a weed. You can see that in the tall plant that has completely taken over this rain garden. That is a goldenrod. We want the goldenrod there. We just don't want it everywhere there. <laughs> so the front of the rain garden where we saw that beautiful palm sedge just a second ago is now being overtaken by the non-native invasive Johnson grass and we do not want it to get a hold in this practice. So we did a, a maintenance work day and went in there, pulled the Johnson grass and cut the goldenrod back to the very center of the bed where, where we want it to be. And now we can see the beautiful palm sedge again. The last maintenance example that I'm going to cover today involves the removal of sediment and that becomes much easier if you incorporate something called a sediment four bay into your project. These are most helpful for rainwater management projects where rainwater runoff can at times carry suspended solids such as sediment off of impervious surfaces like roads and, and sidewalks or the roofs of buildings. This project happens to be an infiltration practice that was constructed along a city street in downtown Springfield. They incorporated a sediment four bay here. And in 2011, when the project was first constructed, you can see that the four bay is filled with um, really attractive ornamental rocks. And then that infiltration basin is full of native plants. Unfortunately, because of deferred maintenance, three years later, that sediment four bay had not been well maintained and the sediment removed from it. So it had filled up and it was starting to um, fill into the infiltration basin and really cause some harm to the plants. And then even more unfortunately, four years later in 2018, maintenance had still been deferred. The sediment four bay and the infiltration bed are now completely clogged over with sediment and all the plants have been smothered. But this project has a happy ending because the last photo, the one there on the right, shows that the sediment for bay was later in 2018 cleaned out, fresh mulch was installed and brand new native plants were planted. So happy ending for this project. That concludes my talk. I would like to thank all of you for your time and attention. I really do appreciate it and hope you've learned some valuable tips for selecting plants and maintaining your wonderful native plant projects. At this time, I'd like to invite Carol to share any questions that have been submitted. Thank you, Rhonda. Wonderful presentation. Yes, we do have a number of questions uh, and I will get through as many of them as I can. Um, this was a very popular uh, webinar with um, more than 800 attendees. So there are quite a few questions <laughs> And um, also seeing uh, many appre appreciative remarks for uh, your webinar. Um, one question, there are a number of folks who had a, a question about mulch. Um, uh, one question was regarding, um, there was an, uh, a couple of rain garden uh, photos that you showed early on, one with mulch and one with rock. And can you comment on if you, if you find one better than another in that kind of a situation? Um, yes, I would say that this, the selection of the type of mulch has to do more with the long-term 
um, maintenance capabilities of the person maintaining the practice than anything else. If you use um, a wood mulch, which I always recommend an undyed mulch because you don't want the dye leaching into the soil, but an undyed wood mulch um, can look very attractive. It can also help absorb some of the rainwater that you're trying to uh, perhaps infiltrate. And it, it, it is, it's, it's beautiful and it's functional, but the issue with a wood mulch is that it tends to need to be refreshed and replaced with fresh mulch either annually or every other year. And that sometimes is just um, a little bit beyond the capacity of a local organization, whether it's a nonprofit group or a city government to stay on top of. I mean, you, you saw that last project. Um, so oftentimes if there are not adequate maintenance personnel or resources on hand, a project manager or the owner of the project will opt to use rock instead, just because it's a little bit easier to maintain over time. Thank you. And there were some questions specifically about the Laurel Ingalls Wilder Museum uh, landscaping project. And I'll try to get through as many of these uh, as I can. Um, Alan is asking, did you have any soil amendments? Uh, what kind of soil prep? Could you discuss a bit about the soil at that project? Sure, absolutely. Um, because it's a really easy answer. I never do any soil amendments. The even for construction projects such as that, um, I do advise that people do not import soil if they have a construction project. When I work with communities, sometimes I'm given the opportunity, opportunity to review the construction plans. And if for the planting plan, if within the specifications, I see that the designer is recommending that topsoil be imported, I always give the recommendation that they um, opt to not do that because you know, you never know where that soil comes from and what sort of seeds might be um, within that topsoil that then would contaminate your site. If there's going to be weeds that come up, I want them to be as local to the project site as possible. So even if the soil looks rough, I don't do any amendments because it may be harsh, but if the native plants can't cut it, then um, you, you've, you've got bigger issues at hand. The native plants are so well adapted to the site conditions that even, even if you look at soil and you think, boy, that looks pretty junky, um, I still do not recommend doing anything to amend it. The only time I amend soil is if I'm working on a rainwater management practice where the purpose is to try to infiltrate water into the ground. And then I might incorporate some sand and compost into the soil that is there on the site, simply to make it a little bit more porous and allow water to infiltrate uh, deeper into the ground um, than it might otherwise. But other than that, even if it's pretty junky uh, construction soil, I, I, I tend to be overly confident perhaps in that the native plants, whether you establish them from seed or from containers, are going to be able to thrive in that local soil. Thank you. And you did use mulch at that project, correct? I, I recall seeing a photo there. Uh, yes. And uh, there are a few questions about kind of um, adapting that kind of a project to a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a question about, you know, number of plants required, a rule of thumb for a minimum number of single type of plant to use. And this kind of gets also at the concept of a green or living mulch. So yes. And, and of course, in, in nature, you know, there isn't, isn't mulch per se, except in, you know, with, with, with leaf litter and a, mm -hmm. or other, other plant litter. But um, could you speak a bit about plant spacing? Because with a, with a quote, living mulch, if plants are placed closer together, then it, it may be less uh, other kind of added mulch isn't as needed because those native plants will be crowding out um, uh, any potential weeds. So could you, could you speak about, um, you know, sort of a, if, if you, if you have a rule of thumb for spacing, 
and uh, a bit about this concept of, of living mulch versus applying uh, other kinds of mulch. Yes, um, so the mulch that we used at the Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum was in part to um, supplement the erosion control uh, fabric that we used under the mulch. So it, it wasn't intended um, to be necessarily refreshed over time because we did want those beds to become so full of the native plants that you wouldn't necessarily even see the ground um, once those plants reach, reach their mature sizes. So the mulch there was intended uh, primarily as an erosion control um, amenity. The using um, leaf color cover throughout the uh, dormant season as sort of a, a mulch, viewing leaf litter as mulch instead of um, something that needs to be on your maintenance checklist to remove um, is fantastic because we know there are a lot of um, insects and small wildlife that will use that leaf litter to overwinter. They'll, they'll bury under the leaf litter. So um, many species of butterflies and moths and then in forest systems will even find very small bats that will crawl underneath that leaf litter to stay warm. So I love seeing leaf litter left on the ground uh, throughout the winter time um, for that purpose. The living mulches are just absolutely fantastic and probably of all the mulch op options, the best one to use if you can get your project to that place. Um, a lot of times we will use a, a living mulch concept as a way to do site, excuse me, site preparation. If we have an area that is, for example, um, today just uh, mowed turf grass and we want to convert that, that field to something like the Laura Ingalls Wilder landscape, what we need to do first is kill off the existing turf grass. Well, in that process, you may, you may end up having a field of just exposed soil and that's concerning because of erosion concerns. So if you can seed that field with a cover crop and allow that cover crop to grow, and I will say that site preparation for this kind of project, we're talking about um, two years, possibly three years, depending on if there's any invasive weeds that are there, it may take three years to get those under control before you invest in, in seeding with your native species. But cover crops are excellent during that transition period because as a cover crop grows, it helps to hold the soil in place and you can easily identify amongst a monoculture of a cover crop if there are unwanted weeds that are trying to grow um, in the area as well. So you can use a cover crop for one or two years while you're waiting to transition to your native plants. And then even after you have your native plants in place, um, as you said, in the spaces between plants, if you're, if you're planting with um, containers, you could see the cover crop between those container plantings. Um, there are various options of cover crops. I will give a word of warning though, that if you are seeding wildflowers, you do want to avoid using winter wheat as a cover crop because the roots are allelopathic and will um, exude a substance that will cause, they won't kill the wildflowers that you seed, but they will cause um, them to be less, uh, to bloom less vibrantly or to have fewer blooms than if you select a different cover crop species. But the uh, USDA, um, the program that is called the Natural Resources Conservation Service, they have wonderful um, resource guides on their website for cover crop selection based on the part of the country where you live and the uh, time of the year that you need a cover crop, whether it's the uh, spring and summer months or fall and winter. There are different species recommended for, for where, uh, what your growing conditions are, depending on what plant zone your project is located in. Thank you, Rhonda. It certainly, uh, 
it the the more plants you're able to to start off with that certainly helps jump start and, and as mm -hmm. you say uh, less less fill in time and of course there are uh there that provides a lot more uh, material in terms of nectar and and pollen mm -hmm. for for uh, visiting insects it, it provides more foliage for uh, insects leaf eating insects um, but then of course those those there can be more seeds and that can create a maintenance issue, especially if there's a, a quite a, a formal area. Um, mm. We had a question about, you know, leaving plant material um, for uh, nesting bees that nest inside stems. And, and you mentioned, of course, the value of leaving, uh, leaving the leaves in, in a bed for those uh, overwintering uh, creatures that you mentioned. Um, so I think in some cases, it. it it probably depends on the situation. In some some cases, uh, a dis, uh, the the entity may feel that it needs to to remove some of that material over the winter, but the cost is less habitat in the winter for for overwintering uh, insects and so forth. So there are trade offs, um, and I, I for those who who would raise a question about this. Um, we do have some resources at the Grow Native website. There's a handy chart um, from Heather Holm, who's a bee biologist, about um, recommendations for different heights of, of leaving vegetation uh, cut at, at different heights and leaving it over winter and then even in the spring, not cutting it all the way back, but leaving a certain height for nesting bees. And we can share that link in an email to the registrants tomorrow. Um, but uh, Rhonda, would you like to comment a little bit more about, you know, the importance of leaving material over winter? Well, I think if you, if you consider the artistic elements of the plants during the winter months, so the, how each species in your plan, what, what the appearance of that plant will be like in the winter, then you can, in your initial design plan for your project, plan for a winter garden where you leave all the material, plant material up that is going to be as striking as any other season of the year. I'm thinking of, you know, having certain grasses in the forefront and then highlighting the woody plants that have extremely interesting winter bark features. So river birches or sycamore trees and you know, we discussed that value means the lightness of, can be the lightness or the darkness of a color. So those trees have very light value trunks. If you place them in front of a, uh, perhaps a fence that is um, a darker color, so you get that contrast of values, you can play around and really create some very visually striking winter gardens that depend on leaving all the the herbaceous plant material up. Um, some people think about winter gardens as just uh, evergreen trees and shrubs, but honestly here in Missouri, we do not have a very long list of native plants that, that are evergreen. Um, we do have cedar trees here that uh, can cause problems when they, when they try to um, encroach upon our, our natural prairie communities, but where cedar trees do grow um, in their native community type here in Missouri, they are one of our very few evergreen species that could be incorporated into a, into a planting plan. Um, so we can't depend on the evergreen species in Missouri for our native winter interest, but there are um, other features, other parts of plants that can be highlighted um, I think it would be a great challenge to see what could be accomplished. Now, this does bring us into a maintenance tip that the people maintaining your garden need to know what your design intent was. So that if your design intent was to leave all the herbaceous material up over winter, that the maintenance crew that comes in doesn't, um, they need to know that. So they don't come in and cut everything down to the ground thinking that they're doing good maintenance work when actually they're doing the opposite of what your design intent was. Thank you, Rhonda. And there was another question about um, season of interest. Uh, for example, a designer might uh, select a suite of species for their summer interest, but then those 
uh, different, those plants could look quite a bit different in the fall and winter. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I wanted to mention that on the Grow Native website, we have a native plant database and it's searchable and you can search on season of interest. And so that might be helpful for uh, to, to create lists of plants that might have interesting bark or other interesting features that would um, provide that winter interest. And then a list can also be generated for um, for uh, growing season interest. But Rhonda, would you like to comment on this a bit more about how, how do you do that? How do you come up with a list um, to have, have you know, some of the considerations that you think about when you're um, looking for year round uh, visual interest? Yes, so this question makes me think of, of the visual weight. And, you know, we talked about balance and dominance and subordination and how dominance was the element in your design that has the greatest visual weight. Well, the dominant feature in your landscape may change season by season based on which plant is going to draw your attention. So you can have more than one focal point in your design. The focal point may change from season to season based on maybe the bloom colors of one plant in the spring versus the fall foliage colors of another plant in the fall versus the the bark color that might provide the visual weight the the heaviest of the visual weight or the pool in the winter time so if you're concerned that one plant that you use because it looks great in the spring is just going to look ho-hum the rest of the year just make sure you're incorporating plants in different parts of the of of your design that are going to pull the eye away from the ho-hum view to the, to the most pleasing view. Um, and this, this doesn't necessarily all have to rely on plant material. You can incorporate um, many other like hardscaping features or water features into your plan. Um, you may have a borrowed view at times of the year that, you know, perhaps you have a plant that looks stunning in the fall but then it quickly uh, loses its visual interest. So maybe, maybe it is a grass that you go in and you cut down at the beginning of winter after it's been its showiest. And after you've cut it down, suddenly you can see what's behind it in the bed, or you can suddenly see what is planted in your neighbor's yard or on the horizon, um, you know, a mile away. Depending on the topography of your site and how the other plants are located, you may be able to borrow your neighbor's view and um, get rid of whatever it is in your garden that just doesn't do it for you. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, there were many comments of folks who appreciated the, the case study at, at the Laura Ingalls Wilder uh, project that you shared and a couple more questions related there. Um, you mentioned that you, you don't use soil amendments except in, in some rain garden situations. Can you say what the soil was like at that particular project? Well, it was, it was extremely rocky, churdy. Um, the, the soil, even though that, that slope was so steep and I was concerned about erosion, the soil type that was there was not one that was prone to erosion. So that did give me a little bit of comfort. Um, that was determined simply by looking at the, the there is a um, soil survey information that you can find. They used to print books by county and I believe it's all gone online and digital now, but the web soil survey that is hosted by the USDA is a website where you can go and you can zoom into your location on a map and there are tabs where you can look at the soil characteristics of that site. There are also tabs where you can look at the ecological site description of the piece of property that you are thinking about doing a planting plan on. And within the ecological site information, you can find a list of what plants were native to that area pre-development. They call that the reference site, which simply means what was growing here before uh, before this area was developed. That is, a, that is such a useful um, tool. Now I will say the Web Soil Survey website is 
very cumbersome. It is not intuitive. It's rather difficult to find your way around, but it is worth it. It's a wealth of information all about um, soil types and characteristics and also native plant information. You just have to dig and dig and dig to find it. Thanks, Rhonda. There was a question about using uh, broadcasting seed versus using plugs to start plantings. Mm -hmm. And of course, with the plugs, you have more control. You know what you're, you know, pretty much what you're planting and where. Um, but can you speak a bit about uh, when you might use uh, seeds versus plugs? Uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the considerations? And Yeah, so um, really the size of the project is one of the, the biggest determining factors. Um, if the project can if, if you have the manpower, either through volunteers or paid contractors um, or staff with your organization that can get out and plant plugs in a timely fashion, then that's a great way to establish a native garden. Um, but if that's not the case, if the area is just a little bit bigger than that, then I would certainly advise that you, you seed the area. Um, the, let's see, at the, uh, I believe it's Shaw Nature Reserve that has a series of landscape, native landscaping manuals on their website. This is with the uh, Missouri Botanical Gardens. One of those, one chapter, I believe there's four chapters that have been published, but one chapter will take you step by step in a very uh, user-friendly way how to successfully seed a tall grass prairie now, the tips they give in the manual for seeding a tall grass prairie, of course, will apply to seeding other types of, of seed, um, but that's the example landscape that they use. But they give great tips about um, materials to incorporate into your native seed to act as a carrying agent if you're going to hand broadcast the seed or use a um, any kind type of um, seed, a uh, mechanical seed broadcaster. One important tip when seeding is that you do not want to till the soil. Native seed only needs to have a firm contact with soil. You don't want to plant it deeper than one eighth of an inch. So often people will hand broadcast seed, but if the area is too large to easily handle by just walking and seeding with people, you can use a no-till drill and use that for larger areas. It just tries to get that seed to soil contact. Um, you can also use a, a roller after you've seeded to roll over the area and try to compress the seed down into the soil a little bit better. But I would say the size of the project space really determines whether seeding or um, using plant plugs is the best option. And, and then just the manpower you have on hand but you want to um, not seed too deep, not break up the soil because you do not want to um, inadvertently uh, cause a bunch of weeds, uh, weed seed in the soil to become activated and start growing. And then using um, a, a mulch, like whether it's a straw mulch or, or other types of mulch in an area, if you are concerned that um, erosion from, from wind or uh, rainwater might be an issue, then it is good to put a layer of, of mulch down on top of your seeds as well. Thank you. And we have some, we'll, we'll include some links uh, to uh, establishing uh, landscapes with native seed, prairie plantings. We'll, we'll include some, some links for folks in an email tomorrow. Um, we also have information on the Grenada site about ground covers um, that are short that can, those can be used as a quote, living green mulch. I, I can see from the comments, there might be a few more questions about that, but what we mean by living or green mulch is simply having, having a, a layer of, of plants that are sort of acting as mulch there they're in, in, in that they are suppressing weeds. And uh, golden groundsel, for example, is something that does stay somewhat evergreen throughout the year. So that's something that folks might want to try. And that, that gets at that uh, winter interest that Rhonda was speaking about mm -hmm. as well. Um, 
there are a number of comments about the importance of leaving seed heads over winter. Of course, they are a very important food source for birds. Um, it's just absolutely right. If, if those are cut down, that removes a seed source for birds. Um, if they're left, just be prepared that there could be a lot of seedlings, which may or may not be desired. Um, so I see a, a number of questions there. So it's just, just a, it's just a, something to keep in mind. Um, the question about when you design, Ron, do, do, do you use straight natives? And you did uh, allude to this a bit um, in the beginning of your presentation. I will just let folks know that our Grow Native program, we focus on straight natives. Um, but in fact, there is so many, there are so many questions about the ecological value of cultivar or nativars. Um, that within our Grow Native program, we are um, working on developing uh, web resources about this issue because it is pretty complicated. Um, but Rhonda, do you want to speak uh, a bit more about um, you know what what you what you specify in your designs? Oh, absolutely. I only specify the the pure native or the true native, and I even take it. I even try to take it down to an ecotype level with my projects, no matter what county of the state I'm working in, I will, I will consult list of native species that are thought to be native to that county and try to limit my um, design palette options to those species and try to find which species in that list meet all of those plant selection criteria I covered today. So, an ecotype is simply, um, it simply refers to that question of how native is native. If the plant was harvested, um, an ecotype will, will be a plant that is harvested as close to your project site as possible. So there may be this, when you start talking ecotypes, you are really becoming an informed consumer because when you go to your native plant nursery and you're selecting plants for your project, you can ask them, I see that you have this beautiful blue stem here. Do you know where the seed was harvested? Where, where in the state was the seed harvested or, or where in the region was the seed harvested that you used to propagate the plants that you were selling now? And they should know where the, the origin of the seeds that they are growing to sell to consumers. Um, but I will take it to that level. I will try to find um, a source of plants that originated as close to a project site as possible. And I find it as a designer, I find it to be a very enjoyable challenge to come up with a plant list that meets all the project goals and objectives, but yet is as native as to the site as possible. I, I think that's an enjoyable challenge. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, a question here about, um, do you in look at incorporating quote, keystone species as Doug Tallamy calls them? That is ones that have a huge bang for the buck at supporting a very large number of native bugs and birds. So for example, um, uh, research has shown that oak trees are uh, in the lower Midwest or perhaps nationally support the greatest number of lepidop of butterfly moth larvae. So they would be a really important tree um, in, ter in ecological terms. Um, do, you, do you look at this, Rhonda, when you are uh, designing and can, can you comment on that? I, I do actually look at that. Um, and it's great that you mentioned oak trees because the last project I did recommend a keystone species for, um, I, an oak tree was at my recommendation. There was a place where they wanted to provide some, uh, some butterfly habitat. And then there was an opportunity at this particular location to plant one very large tree in the corner of the property and have some benches underneath it for people to gather. So it was a gathering space inside of a, a butterfly haven. And I recommended an oak tree um, because of the size it would reach at maturity, because it would provide um, a, a good focal point, a place for people to gather underneath the oak. I even said, you know, if, 
if um, they wanted to designate that oak tree as perhaps a memorial tree. Um, this was at a, this garden space was at a nonprofit organization. And so if they had happened to have um, staff that was no longer with them or people in their field that they wanted to remember, the tree could function also, it could be a designated memorial tree for those people. Um, or alternatively, it could be designated as, you know, like the, uh, um, the place for people to talk and come to agreement if they were uh, working on a deal together, they could meet at the, uh, you know, at, at the talking tree, so to speak. Um, so all, all sorts of fun ways that you can designate additional meaning to certain plants that are featured in your landscape. But I didn't, I didn't even offer them any other alternative species to an oak tree because I thought, well, in this location, if you're going to have a large canopy sized tree in this spot, there's no reason to not make it an oak tree because of all the associated ecological benefits that that species provides. So it is absolutely something I can I consider, but then I try to justify it within the design as well as um, for its, its ecological functions. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, uh, have to, a few more questions here. We probably need to, to wrap up here pretty soon, although we have still have more than 400 people in attendance. So I'd like to try to address a few more questions if we can. Um, there were some questions about um, kind of uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the stormwater um, garden that you showed along the roadside and, and, you, and you mentioned how the four bay had not been maintained um, mm -hmm. and, and can you explain what would have what would have been good um, maintenance of that four bay? What would have allowed that to function? Oh yes, I'm, it's incredibly simple. You get shovels out there and you scoop up all of the rocks, all of the sediment, completely empty out. I mean, it's a, you could see it, it was a very small space, but you completely empty out everything that is in that space, all the way down to underneath the decorative rock would have been a layer of a filter fabric. So you could even take the filter fabric up and replace it with some new fabric. And then you would rinse off the, the decorative rocks, get all the silt off of them, reinstall the rock on top of the filter fabric, and then all of the accumulated sediment that was removed, then it gets disposed of. It either um, gets put in a plate. Now, it's runoff from a road, so it could potentially have other contaminants in it. So most likely in that situation, it would simply be um, put into a, a dumpster and taken to the landfill and just completely removed in, in that way. But it's, it's not complicated. It's just you just got to get out there and have somebody who uh, that's their assignment for the day and they go out and they just scoop dirt. Thanks, Ron. And of course, that that four bay and that is doing exactly what what it's intended to do mm -hmm. is to keep that sediment and those contaminants out of storm drains, which lead in most cases to streams. So you're absolutely right. Um, most places that have any kind of landscaping, for example, with lawns, there's a schedule for lawn mowing. There can be schedules for native landscape maintenance as well. Um, another comment that, that someone had a good a good comment about seeds versus plugs and of course you there are many good reasons that you went over around and of course another is cost and just size uh, you know uh, and the plugs are going to be more expensive and it depends on the size but of course the seeds can be a more affordable um, option as well um, there were some questions about erosion control structures um, on a slope and at the Laringles Wilder, I thought it was a really great how you use that uh, uh, device at the, at the top of the planting, not just along the slope and at the bottom um, to, to prevent that runoff. Can you talk a, a bit more about um, structures that you use in a sloped planting to control erosion as the planting is becoming established? Yes, so in that particular case, we devised, we utilized the 
the erosion control socks, which are just like a long linear tube, like a sausage tube, um, full of just like a compost type of material. But we place that sock along the top of the slope specifically to divert the water from the slope. We, we caused the water that was running off the, the roof of the building, the front of it did not have a gutter system. So all the water from the roof was coming straight off and flowing across the sidewalk and then would flow down the bed. So this was just a, um, a temporary practice that we installed while the plants became established and then we removed it. But we simply were trying to divert the runoff and make the water flow down the sidewalk instead of through the plant beds. Now, once the plants became established, those erosion control socks were removed and the fabric that was used underneath the mulch, it was the type of um, fabric that was made out of, of a material like a coconut husk or a type of a woven um, twine, some sort of grass that is intended to just biodegrade in place. You don't have to go back later and, and remove it. It biodegrades and uh, decomposes in the bed. So yes, I would say that if at all possible, while your plants become established, divert runoff from going through the bed and have it go around the bed instead. And if that's not an option, then you may need to try to um, have it meander through the bed as much as possible. And that might be through temporary um, structures as well, or you know, perhaps through placement of, of rocks or soil berms that once your plants become established, you can go in and knock those berms down. Um, but any way that you can keep from channeling water, if you wanna reduce its erosive capability, you want to spread it out as much as possible and you wanna slow it down. So however you can do that um, by spreading out instead of concentrating the flow and slowing it down, water slows down if it runs over rough surfaces. So maybe large size rock mulch um, that then is later replaced with something smaller. Water also slows down if it has to flow through um, thick foliage. So right where you have water entering your bed, if you're able to, perhaps that's where you plant a couple of um, tall, thick clumps of native grasses like switchgrass that are really going to cause that runoff to slow down as it goes through all of the, the grasses and then maybe not be moving fast enough to be able to cause erosion issues on the other side of the grass clumps. So those are the best ways, either divert the runoff or spread it out and slow it down. That's an excellent point about the thick, thick uh, plants at the top. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you mentioned, after the, but the, 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 the planting is, is established, hopefully it can take all the water that, you know, that can flow through there mm -hmm. and even if it's not a rain garden, it is still really important for absorbing and, and managing that stormwater. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask Rhonda just one more question that will hopefully address uh, several questions that have come in. But before I do that, I just wanna remind everyone before you tune off that we do have more webinars on many different topics through March. And then we will have more after that. They will, they're weekly through March and then um, we will be looking to add more, uh, maybe not on a weekly basis, but add more after March. And again, uh, you can find many, many resources on um, protecting prairies at the Missouri Prairie Foundation website, moprairie.org, um, and at the Grow Native website, grownative.org, you can find our native plant database that's searchable of more than 300 native plant species, and we're adding to this all the time. We have top 10 lists for very specific um, growing conditions and purposes, um, many, many other resources, and we will share some links uh, to those to you, in, including, very importantly, our resource guide to suppliers of native plant products and services. So we um, have over 120 or 30 professional members who sell plants or seeds or our landscape designers or architects, retail garden centers that sell native plants, 
And you can find that information at the Grenadive website. And to, to finish up, Rhonda, there were a couple of questions about um, there are plants like some goldenrods or some milkweeds that have uh, can be very beautiful, wonderful ecological um, uh, purposes, but they can be aggressive or um, you know, maybe not suitable for certain looks that you're trying to achieve. Can you talk a bit about how to use plants like milkweeds or goldenrods that um, have may have great design elements, but how do you manage how do you manage them? You know, if they tend to be aggressive. Well, <laughs> you either you either don't attempt it, and you find alternative species that can still provide either the artistic elements that you desire or that provide um, similar types of ecological benefits but aren't as aggressive, or you just have to invest the time and resources into staying on top of them and doing your, your maintenance throughout, uh, throughout the year. Um, so that might be as the example that I showed with the goldenrod that took over the rain garden, getting in there and cutting down or pulling the ones that are escaping the zone that, that you want them to grow in. And I mean, I, I don't know of any other strategies than that, either use an alternative species that is not as aggressive or you're just going to have to spend the time doing the maintenance. Thank you, Rhonda. And again, that points to the importance of design and planning. And um, this is a great time of year to, to do that planning, to uh, think about um, adding to or creating native gardens uh, in the growing season. Thank you, Rhonda, so much for an incredibly informative and well-prepared presentation. Um, I know uh, everyone who tuned in really enjoyed it, and uh, we will send out a link to the a recording of Rhonda's presentation um, and some other resources to help address uh, questions that you have that we may not have been able to answer and to help you um, in your native gardening and native uh, plant design projects. So. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rhonda, and everyone have a good night.